Well, I've fished almost all my life. I've done other things, but it's uh, it's a different way of life, and uh, you, it gets into your blood, I guess, and you, that's the only way there is to make a living. Yeah, my father, he was a fisherman all his life. He died when he was 80 years old, and he fished it until he was about 75, he fished, and then we took over the three boys, and we fished the outfit. Well, I think maybe the freedom and getting out, you know, being your own boss, maybe, had something to do with it, I, I couldn't say. They're free, they're independent, see? They're, it, you're working for it, though, you're, you're really, really working. Clean, healthy, this is the easiest life, I'll grant you that, but uh, that's, the, that's the only life, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, but <laughs> that's all I've ever done. That's all I've ever done, this fish. I love it. Marvin Weeborn. He and his sons, Mark and Jeff, are commercial fishermen on Lake Michigan's Green Bay. Their home port, Gills Rock on the tip of Wisconsin's Door Peninsula. It's September. On their gillnet tug, the Islander, the Weeborgs get ready for the day's lift. The Weeborgs are out after whitefish, the most highly prized of all Great Lakes fishes. Caught in a gill net, which hangs like an anchored curtain a hundred feet beneath the surface, the fish are hauled up through this door. We left about eight to ten boxes every day. Each box is a 1,300 feet long, so that adds up to about 10,000 feet of net we lift every day. We lift them. And after we got done lifting them, then we reset them out to the third door. We usually take one box home a day and fix on it, repair it for the trout to damage the net. The fishermen are careful to avoid these hefty lake trout. According to state regulations, if they should catch more than 10% lake trout in their lift, they have to move their nets. Once a staple of the Lake Michigan fishery, native lake trout were wiped out by the sea lamprey invasion of the 1940s and 50s. Today, the only lake trout in Lake Michigan are those put there by the State Department of Natural Resources. These are reserved for sportsmen, a tender point with the commercial fishermen. But the Weeborgs do well enough with their whitefish harvest. A good lift. When the price is up around a dollar a pound, if you can get two, three hundred pounds a day, you're doing well. You're making wages. It usually works out where you catch a lot of fish and then you don't catch anything. So that's why you hope for these big lifts because you don't know if you're going to get any fish at all, you know. <laughs> well, as far as I'm concerned, there's no cleaner life as far as the air and the... And the you never know what you're going to catch. It's a gamble from day to day. You may get a big lift, you may get nothing. And that's what you live with. And I say, we've, we've always made a good living at it. Uh, like the fishermen before them, like fishermen everywhere, the men inside the islander epitomize the American spirit. Hardworking, religious, independent, stubborn. Once you're into it, it, it seems like you never want to get out of it. Your fever that stays with you as long as you live, I guess. It's a fever that's been in the Weeborgs' blood for four generations. This is the story of the Weeborgs and their fellow fishermen around the Great Lakes. 
told mostly in their own words. Like fishermen everywhere, they carry on one of the oldest professions known to man. They are the living past, confronting an uncertain future. Out here, like a planet enveloped by a thousand stars, the islander seems suspended in time and space. Her home port could just as easily be Astoria, Oregon, or Port Judith, Rhode Island. men to fish the Great Lakes were Indians, followed by French Canadians who trapped furs for profit and fished for their food. Here on Mackinac Island, these, the first Mackinac boats were built. Sturdy and graceful, they liberated the fishermen from the shore, enabling them to seek their prey in deeper waters, to seek the herring, chubs, and lake trout so abundant in those early days. These fishermen with their uh, Mackinac boats, they were called. They were double-enders of light wood that could be pulled up on the beach. A couple of men could pull them right up on the beach. You put a throw a log under them, and, and yet they were big enough so you could do a little fishing off the shoreline. Like the railroads of the West, the Mackinaws and other sailing ships opened up the Great Lakes for settlement. The earliest settlers traveled down from Mackinac Island, making their homes along the shores and islands of northern Lake Michigan. These islands, which form the gateway to Green Bay, were settled long before the nearby mainland, settled mostly by fishermen. Many of them came from Europe in the mid-1800s, fishermen from Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, lured by reports of rich harvests from America's vast freshwater seas. Around the lake, every coastal town became a fishing port. And for the fishermen, the lake was both their livelihood and their community. Each could claim a cousin or a sister or an uncle in almost every port. That community still exists today. Gills Rock was one of the first settlements on the Door Peninsula. Among the first families to settle on Gills Rock were the Weeborgs. Today, Marvin Weeborg carries on the fishing tradition started there by his grandfather a century ago. He recalls fishing in those days. All oh, these strictly sailboats. Rowboats or sailboats. That's all they had when they started. Then they went into gasoline, and now, of course, it's going into diesel. My dad started with a steam tug. They built it here, right on the shore here. My dad and his two brothers. They had a boat by the name of A.A. A. Weaver. Terrific size fish, the same in the gill nets, if you noticed this morning. We had 300 pounds there today, a jumbo's out of that lift there today. Well, that, that's big fish. You get them today? Today we only had about 600. Well, that's big. That's plenty, ain't it? And then... Oh, that's a good lift. Yes, I guess so. But, boy, I'll tell you here, Last week we were coming in with a ton, 25. Yeah. Where from? Across? All the west grounds out there. It's funny, we never got white fish there before. It just, just, you couldn't believe it. Did they all get fish there? Everybody was, they're going up to 30 hundred. Yeah, well, that's when you do the damage to them. Cap Larson spent more than 60 of his 84 years fishing the Great Lakes. He's lived through many changes in the fishery. The first white fish I ever seen was in about 1909 or 10. The oh. first one I ever seen. Now I've seen one before in about 1906. Yeah. Didn't know what they were then. Well, they had been here then, I suppose, during the Civil War, and then they were either fished out or something, and they were gone that long. Uh -huh. How long did it take then when you first started seeing them come back? How long did it take before they really come back? You well, they, then they came back in about 1923. Oh, yeah. And they were. They weren't too big. They were about one size. Oh, yeah. And they didn't last too long that time either. Uh -huh. They were gone. 
Well, uh, tell the truth about it, fished off. Yeah. Sometimes the victims of nature, sometimes the victims of their own greedy harvests. The fishermen faced many lean years. Once, times were so bad that some men shipped their tugs to the East Coast to fish the Atlantic Ocean. Like Cap Larson, Verna Johnson, now 94, remembers those days. Her father was a fisherman, as was her husband, her sons, and her grandsons. This is Charlie, that was the fellow that I married. And that, that was our first baby, that was Melvin. My husband, my son, both of them used to fish. That was, you might know, that was yeah. <laughs> right in them. That's all they wanted to do was fish. Mm -hmm. That's lifting a pond net in the winter time on the ice. Well, it was, the biggest part of it was done by hand, you know. So they, it was, it was really hard labor is what it was. nets and hard work. The fisherman's life hasn't changed much in 50 years, nor have the dangers he faces. It's the most practiced place in the world, especially up here where you've got Lake Michigan on one side and the and, uh, bay on the other. You're never safe. The worst is when it blows hard from the southeast and fills the bay with Lake Michigan water and then with a quick shift around. That's when you get it. That's when you get the bad one. Yeah. Well, I've never seen a disaster yet. Fishermen are the greatest sailors in the world. Never been lost and never been stranded on the water. We've had mishaps as far as the out on the water. We've had the doors cave in on them. We've had the port lights break on them. We've had uh, the water roll in by the barrels. But, uh, I mean, that's uh, nothing that, that would bother you. You know, I never used to worry. I left all that, that stuff to the Lord, and he, he took care of me. They always came back safe, but I always looked forward to that it was, things were going to be all right. Great Lakes fishing is considered the eighth most dangerous profession in the United States. But the perils which the fishermen face today seem to be less natural and more of man's own making. At the county courthouse in Green Bay today, the State Department of Natural Resources held a public hearing on proposed changes in state commercial fishing regulations. The state wants to close Lake Michigan to chub fishing. The chubs have declined dramatically recently, and the DNR fears that the fishermen may deplete the remaining population. Claude Verdine, a member of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, commented to newsmen. We don't believe that uh, commercial fishing uh, is going to deplete it. Economics enter into the picture before you deplete a, a stock of fish. If a fisherman goes out there and can't catch enough fish to uh, make it pay, he quits. And most biologists agree that he quits long before the brood stock is destroyed. And so it comes back again uh, through the natural process. The commercial fishermen are afraid that this and other rules proposed by the DNR may force them out of business and that, they say, would hurt the general public, which depends on them for fresh fish. A little rule here, a little rule there, another little rule, another little... And what it amounts to is just gradually cutting our throat. So we're, we've come to the point now, either we're going to fish or we're going to quit, one or the other. They seem to think that every new regulation or any amendment in the regulations that we pass portends uh, their demise. We're probably more open to their views than we've ever been in the past. 
guys coming down and taking the digging through the wardens coming down and digging through the fish, coming right on our boats and digging through the fish, ruining our product. They think nothing of it. They could care less. Uh, I can I can appreciate their feelings because the lake trout was not avidly sought after as a sport fish in, in that period of time prior to the sea lamprey. So they're faced with uh, quite a change here in the way people view the Lake Michigan fishery, principally for sport at the present time. This is Ron Poff, Great Lakes Fisheries Manager for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. It's his job to see that the fish stocks in the lakes are protected and that the fishery is managed in the public interest. But what really is the public interest? Does it mean fish for sport or fish for food? The conflict between sports and commercial fishing is not unique to these waters. It's happening on every coast. The state of Michigan has decided to manage its Great Lakes waters for the benefit of the multi-million dollar sports fishing industry. The DNR there has now banned the large mesh gillnet claiming that it kills too many lake trout. In taking this action, Michigan has driven its commercial fishery to the brink of extinction. But I was going to let my son keep on fishing, see what? He can't do it anymore. He can't make a go out of it, see? I've got all kinds of nets. i got two sheds full of nets. Another shed full over there of nets, but they're no good if you can't fish them. So we might as well quit, I guess. In 1963, there were 4,500 commercial fishermen in Michigan. Today, less than 150 remain. Yes, I fished out of uh, Waukegan, I fished out of Kenosha, I fished out of Benton Harbor, Michigan, Saugatuck, Grand Haven, Ludington. Frankfurt and Charleway. Okay, you can't, uh, uh, you're restricted too much now. You can't fish where you'd like to fish. And uh, you can't fish the nets you want to fish. If they don't have a sudden change, that'll, that'll be the end. When you see a large fish stock out there and you know they're highly populated, it's hard to convince people like myself and my, my family that we shouldn't be able to go out there and get those and supply them to the public. There's going to come a day when our country is going to need some of this protein. And when they once get them all out of business, it's going to be hard to get someone to go back into it again with all our regulations and our holdups through the DNR, that it's going to be practically impossible for somebody to start. I tell you, the opposition uh, comes from um, uh, sports organizations and uh, businesses. Uh, private sporting businesses who feel a threat from commercial fishing. I really, the, the great absurdity is, is uh, that I cannot understand is how anybody can be threatened by 150 men and fishing 2% of the Great Lakes. I, I just find that very difficult to see how that can threaten anyone. John Magnuson is a Lutheran minister in St. Ignace, Michigan, just a few miles from Mackinac Island. As I became more and more involved, I saw the kinds of uh, the kinds of accusations and the kind of money that was involved. And over and against that, I saw a group of 150 commercial fishermen in all of Michigan. Most of these guys are Indians, French, Swedes, Norwegians. They're unsophisticated, uneducated, independent as hell, uh, stubborn competing against each other all their life, and now suddenly thrown into a situation where they have to organize to save themselves. Jeff Weborg has helped organize the fishermen of northeastern Wisconsin. Arrested in July for possessing illegal fish, Jeff and others have brought suit against the DNR for harassment. At a meeting, he brings the fishermen up to date. We've got to take care of the task force. Now, where's my agenda? Here it is, yeah. Hey, we'll take that to the attorney. Okay, old business we're going to go on first. Uh, I'm a little bit about our federal briefs. 
uh, our federal case it's in court and uh, we want to continue fishing the same as if they're uh, trying to put us out of business uh, we want to stay in the fishing business oh like my younger sons there they've got many years they can still fish how many I young fishermen do you see this day as a minister one of the real tragic things is to see uh, the commercial fishermen awareness of what's happening to them they're victims uh, they don't feel they can really uh, fight. They don't feel they really have a voice. Uh, they don't feel that um, you know, they can really do anything. conflict between sport and commercial is much more overplayed than it needs to be. I think it's uh, a lot of it was fabricated um, and, and I think a lot can be done but we need money, we need expertise and, and we need a, a little break from running backwards all the time. to this whole thing and it's very simple all they have to do is plant a lot of fish and harvest there's no reason why they shouldn't do that plant lots of whitefish plant lots of trout and then harvest there's no question that this lake has got to be farmed
what is the fish boil? That's the first thing they ask. Who to eat boiled fish? Well, this is what they'd come with. Well, uh, try it. Well, then they try it. Well, they had never eaten anything like that. Well, this is the way it kept on for about two years. Then uh, the fellow from the Viking Grill down here, I told him, I said, why don't you go in business? Well, you think it would pay? Well, I said, I know it would, I said. Several times during the summer, all the fishermen plan to have their community friends and neighbors over. And we get together and boil one or two kettles full of fish and potatoes and onions. And we all enjoy food together and fellowship, too. For Betty Weeborg, there are joys in being a fisherman's wife. And like Verna Johnson, she understands the fishing fever. It's long hours, and yet it has its advantages. You're your own boss, and Jeff wouldn't have it any other way. And it's something that we would, I would like to see passed on through the family, through the generations, if at all possible, because I feel it is a family heritage and a tradition that should be kept on. It's late December, nearly Christmas. Lake Michigan turns somber gray and thickens with cold. A snow squall threatens from the north. Heated within by a wood stove, the islander plies the quicksilver, her decks covered with snow. Marvin Weeborg spots his buoy. Mark retrieves it from the deceptively tranquil sea and the day's lift begins. Perhaps Mark has wondered more than once if he might soon see the end of the bountiful net. Surely the Great Lakes will always be fished for food, but never again as they once were. No more will every coastal town boast its own fishing fleet. No more will the lakes be harvested so freely and fewer sons will follow their fathers out to sea. Fishing will become more of a business, less a tradition. As for the men of the Islander, they may well be among the last of their breed. The last fishermen.